Howdy partners, it's Gomlet Tex, and today is the launch of Outlaws of Thunder Junction on Magic Arena, so we're going to be playing our very first sealed event to the brand new format. Without further ado, let's bust open these packs and see where the cards take us today. Alright, so here's a look at our rares for today, and as you can see, one of the spicier things about this format is that it does have two bonus sheets in it, so there's going to be one crime in every pack. Crime is a new mechanic, it just means that if you target your opponents, or one of their permanents, or their graveyard, basically if you look in your opponent's direction, you've committed a crime. So there's a bunch of cards that are like, whenever you commit a crime, you get to do something. So... The crimes off of the bonus sheet are a bunch of classic instant sorcery stuff like that from Magic's past that targets your opponent or their graveyard or one of their permanence cards that all technically commit a crime. So for our rare from these, we got Abrupt Decay, but we did get one in every single pack, so that means there's five uncommons that might be pretty sweet to look at when we are in the sealed pool. We also got a rare from the Big Score. That is kind of the vault of this format. Uh, it was supposed to be its own separate set, like March of the Machine Aftermath was to March of the Machine, but that set did very poorly, so they just shoved the Big Score into the main Outlaws at Thunder Junction set, and you get one card from the big score every now and then. They're much more rare than the crimes. You get a crime in every single pack, but these are more random. I think it's like one out of every six or something like that. I have no idea. The odds, uh, they're all rares and mythics, though, and they're all pretty constructed-focused, pretty constructed-oriented. So there's not a lot that are particularly easy to build around in, uh, in draft and sealed, as you can see by this being like a three color rare and you want to have a bunch of permanents on board and stuff like that it's still a cool card it still could be powerful if we head into those colors but they are definitely some really long text boxes and some interesting unique stuff going on to these big score cards so with our more unique rares out of the way we'll get to the bread and butter here the main set rares and mythics we've got a lot of really powerful ones here that are going to be consistently good no matter how we build our deck so we've got Bonnie Paul Clear Cutter. This is a 6 mana, 6 5 reach, and she comes with Bow, this legendary ox with power and toughness equal to the number of lands you control. And every time you attack, you draw a card and you can put a land from your hand onto the battlefield. Really insanely good card. 6 mana for a 6 5 and a 6 6, probably. You'll probably have 6 lands out at the time is just nuts, so that is one of our best rares for sure. The Stoic Sphinx as well is incredibly difficult to deal with. You can flash this in in your opponent's end step at instant speed, then you've got a 5-3 flyer on the board, and it has hexproof as long as you haven't cast a spell this turn. So if you're just your average limited deck, that means it's going to have hexproof during your opponent's turn almost every time. You just attack in with it, and then main phase two, that's when you cast your spells, so your opponent only has a very short window of opportunity to blow up the Stoic Sphinx, and that is like your second main phase is the only time this card is not going to have Hexproof if you play with it well, so really nasty card. Uh, the Stinger Back Terror out of red is really huge. you got to lower the amount of cards in your hand, so you want to cast a bunch of stuff or plot a bunch of stuff, but if you do, this thing will be massive. Plot is a very cool new mechanic where you can exile the card from your hand, uh, at sorcery speed to then play it for free on a later turn. So you can spend only three mana to cast this thing. You just have to wait a turn to actually cast it. And it can be, as you can see, as big as a 7-7 seven, seven flying tramples. That thing's insane. There's hell to pay, which is huge X mana removal. One of our most self-explanatory rares. That one's incredible. Kellen the Kid could be really fun if we go green, white, blue. So I really think that we're going to go green, white, blue, or green, blue, red if we can help it, if we've got the fixing to get there and just decent cards in those colors, because those are going to give us access to some of our strongest rares. If we go green, blue, red, we get to play Bonnie, Stoic Sphinx, Stingerback Terror, and Hell to Pay. Uh, as well as loot, the key to everything. If we go green, white, blue, we get Bonnie, Stoic Sphinx, and Kellen. And Kellen plays really well with plot cards. So if you plot something from your hand, you are exiling it, and then you're casting it for free later. So you are technically casting it from somewhere other than your hand, so you can cast an additional spell for free with Kellen's ability. So that's really spicy, as well as just a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three flying lifelink already being pretty nuts. So... 
really strong rares here. Uh, there's one really weak one with the Pitiless Carnage. This is super narrow. It's only going to be good really late in the game when you have a bunch of extra lands sitting around. So it's not the kind of card you're going to want all the time, uh, which is what makes it pretty situational, pretty narrow, and pretty weak. Because if you're in an aggressive race and you top deck this thing, it's like, well, I don't want to sack anything right now. I really want to impact the board, and this doesn't do any of that. So it's a cool card. It can be really explosive in the right position when you're in a top deck war, but generally pretty bad. And then Vraska is cool and powerful, and that's a lot of text that I haven't fully read yet, but Vraska just happens to be pretty off-color for most of our other rares. I guess we could end up going like Soul Tie with Bonnie, Sphinx, and Vraska. And what on earth does Vraska do exactly? Because I see a lot of good text here. So it's when the creature dies, you pay one, return to the battlefield tapped as a treasure in addition to its other types? No, instead of its other types. Yeah, that's still pretty good. Right? So a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three death touch, every time a creature an opponent controls dies, you steal it as a treasure token on your board. So if they have creatures with good enter the battlefield effects, you kind of just win. It loses its other card types, but it doesn't lose its abilities. So if you're in Magical Christmas Land and you kill your opponent's Bonnie, then when you steal it and you make a Bonnie treasure, you're also making the bow token. You're getting a massive creature. Yeah, it really depends what your opponent has, but... Even just making treasures is pretty fine, like pretty solid, actually. Um, and if they have things with enter the battlefield effects or um, just abilities that matter, even if the card isn't a creature, then you're going to be really happy with Vraska. So pretty cool, pretty powerful card. So a lot of ways to go here. I mean, we're almost definitely trying to be green, blue at the core again, because then we get to go green, blue, white, green, blue, red, green, blue, black. Um, and... Either of those directions we go, we're going to have tons of rares. Abrupt Decay, Stoic Sphinx, Bonnie, and Vraska for Sultai. Um, all these cards for Teemer. All these for Bants. Yeah, really solid rares. Really cool place to start the format off. But let's check out our multicolored and colorless stuff now. Just what I usually do at the start of uh, any sealed pool deck building, because then I can see if there are any multicolored cards really pulling us in a specific direction. A lot of the multicolored uncommons can be just about as powerful as your average like monocolored rare, so they can kind of pull you in their direction and try to get you to be that specific archetype, so good to keep an eye on them. So we've got Baron Bertram Greywater, which is a black-white sacrifice deck kind of card. It's going to be pretty specific. We need a lot of good build-arounds to get that really going, but it can be really cool in the right deck, so I think probably better in uh, draft than sealed. Um, so not super pumped about that here. Um, not just because it doesn't seem um, super easy to build around, but also because uh, none of our rares really overlap well to be playing specifically white and black together. We do have a Tyrant Scorn, which gives us some more very flexible removal. If we go Soul Tie, if we go Blue, Green, Black, plus there we go, Blue, Black, Dual Land to help out there. We do have a Blue, White, Dual Land to help out if we go Green, White, Blue. We've got a Green, Red, Dual Land to help out if we're going Green, Red, Blue. And ooh, some more Green, Red, and Blue cards. The Cactus Folk Sure Shot is a 4-mana four 4-4 four, four Reach Ward 2 at worst. That is just a great stat line. For that to be the worst the card can do um but if we're living in magical christmas land and we're super lucky and we play this thing on turn four and then we play bonnie on turn five <laughs> this gives bonnie and bonnie's ox trample and haste at the beginning of combat yeah this is this is a really strong card i like that a lot that cactus folk and we've got a Buried in the Garden if we go green-white. I mean, if our fixing is good enough, we could play green-white, blue, and red. I don't know about full five color, but that is a possibility. Uh, this is an excellent card. It's a really good removal spell that gives you mana fixing at the same time, so it's very, very helpful. So that'll be really sweet if we go green-white, black to fit in Kellen. And this green-blue uncommon is also quite good. Make your own luck. It's a five mana draw three, basically which is a lot of mana, but you get to plot one of the three cards that you draw. So if you hit something that costs four or five mana off of this, you exile that card so you can cast it for free on the next turn. So it's like giving you a big discount on one of those spells to make up for the fact that you spent five mana to draw three. So if you spend that five mana and you hit a five mana spell, it's almost like you drew the three cards for free. You just had to spend a little bit of time, spend a little bit of tempo to do it. 
Um, but yeah, usually that's going to be worth it, and that's going to be really nice. So I like that a lot as well. Uh, if we play green and blue. Um, this desert looks very bad, right? This is mana fixing for mounts, and that is it. Otherwise, it's going to be a colorless land, which is just really bad for a three plus color deck. Yeah, obviously it's designed for a very mount heavy deck, and I don't think we will be. I haven't seen any mounts yet. Mounts is another new card type for the format. They're pretty interesting. Let me give you an example here real quick before we move to colorless. There we go. Here's an example. So mounts are like if you took a vehicle and a creature and you made it one thing. So the creature's just already there and it's going to do its thing. It's going to be a two mana two two and you're like, all right, cool. But they have additional abilities if you saddle them, which is similar to how you would crew a vehicle. It's sorcery speed instead. So at sorcery speed, you have to tap total creatures or any number of creatures with total power, two or more on this one, because it has saddle two. If you do that, then you'll get your saddle ability when it attacks. So this one's saddle ability is, boom, mill two cards, give it plus X plus X, where X is number of creature cards in your graveyard. So this is for some kind of like Golgari graveyard deck. So pretty cute ability, the whole saddle and mount thing. Could be fun to build a deck around, but um, not really going to be consistent in sealed, especially because like it took a while to find a mount there. All right, now Mirage Mesa, though, is very good fixing. That is basically Evolving Wilds or Terramorphic Expanse. It hits the board tapped, but it's going to be whatever color we need. Speaking of good mana fixing, the Silver Deputy can grab whatever basic land or desert we need, put it on top of our library. Generally, you're going to want to put a basic on top, even though the deserts are the dual lands in the format. Um, these Bristling Backwoods style cards. Um, just because it's really, really slow to spend two mana to play this and then put a land on top of your deck so you know you're just going to top deck a land next turn and then also that land's a tap land. So it really depends on what your mana curve looks like, but a lot of the time you're going to want to just get a basic so you can still play like a three drop turn three, a four drop turn four, uh, but it is still really helpful fixing. So that's nice as well. Um, then some treasure tokens from gold pen are okay. Uh, but just one treasure token is really not enough to to qualify that card as like full on mana fixing or anything. So not super excited about that. So let's check out all of our colors individually now, see what's looking sweet and see what direction we're taking these incredible rares. Starting off with our white, it looks like a bunch of decent creatures here. Nothing completely insane. I actually really like this big horn. 4 mana, 3, 4 Vigilance, but if you have creatures on board with power, total power 2 or more, that aren't really attacking in on this board, so imagine you just have like a 3-1 Erinx or something, and they've got plenty of 1-1s to just kill this thing, you can now use the Erinx to saddle the Bighorn and start spitting out sheep tokens, and then after doing that just a little bit, the sheep tokens can saddle the big horn. So you just have a big horn sending in with a bunch of sheep riding on it. And you're getting more tokens. And it's a pretty cool card. It's a pretty powerful one too. Um, Bovine Intervention. I don't love these kind of removal spells in Limited where you're destroying their card, but you're giving them something back because they're kind of less than a one for one. You're just mitigating their card. You're making it a little bit weaker, but it's still there. It's still going to be beating you down, even if it is just a two two now. So... Not a huge fan of that, but Ariat's Lullaby seems fine. Mystical Tether seems like great removal. And Rampage seems like a flexible trick. It's cool. Yeah, our white seems fine, but there's just a bunch of okay filler commons for the most part. We'd really just be playing white to throw our rares in like Kellen. For our blue, we of course have that Stoic Sphinx. Uh, but for the commons and uncommons, we've got the really flexible counterspell with phantom interference. This shows off the new spree mechanic. So with spree, it's another kind of kicker variant. You have to spend at least one of the spree costs. So you got to be doing at least like two mana counterspell and that's, unless it's controller pays two. But that's a fine card. Um, but you can do more than that. So if it's turn four and you're holding this up as a counterspell and then they just don't cast anything then cool, spend a blue and three, get your 2-2 two, two flyer, and then untap and hit them with it on your next turn. Alternatively, if it is turn five, 
you can spend five mana and you can do both of these things. You can get the 2-2 flyer and counter their spell, and then you're living the dream. Then you're in a really good spot with this interference. So I think the card's pretty sweet. Emergent Haunting, that's a lot of text. Uh, if you're doing a lot of plotting to where you're not casting spells from your hand, you're putting them into exile and then casting them from exile, then this is pretty good, but it's obviously designed for specifically that kind of deck. It does become the 3-3 forever, right? At the beginning of your end step, if you haven't cast a spell from your hand, and it isn't a creature, it becomes a 3-3 with flying in addition to its other types. Yeah, it never stops being the 3-3 flyer. All right, yeah, that does seem quite good for a plot deck. If you don't have enough plot or instant speed stuff to do, though, probably wouldn't run it. But we'll, we're going to have at the very least already the Stoic Sphinx and two counter spells to hold up. So seems pretty cool. Definitely, definitely consider it. Uh, four mana instants and sorceries here. Stop cold. Looks like a fine filler removal spell. Plan the heist. Ooh, four mana draw three. If you have no cards in hand, it's surveil three, then draw three. And you can plot it, which is perfect. That means you plot it out of your hand so that whatever you top deck the turn afterward, you know you can cast that before you cast this so that you still have uh, zero cards in hand. That's super sweet. Uh, this Town 8 Big Enough is a great, really flexible bounce spell. You return your opponent's best permanent back to their hand, and you can bounce your own cheap permanent that has a good enter the battlefield effect, and then you get to do it for only 2 mana. But, if you have the 5 mana later in the game, then boom, bounce your opponent's best 2 permanents back to their hand, and get a huge tempo swing, so I like that a lot. I really like our blue here. Canyon Crab is another one of these um, plot-focused and instant-speed-focused cards. You want to try to not cast anything during your turn to get value off of it, but you can get great value. We could try to build a mill deck with this Deep Muck Desperado. Every time we're targeting our opponent or their stuff, we're also milling them three. It's cute. Nimble Brigand, every time we target their stuff, this thing's unblockable. We can draw extra cards off of it. This isn't uh, a very good combo with a lot of what our deck is doing, though. Or a lot of what our blue is doing. We're trying to do stuff at instant speed and not during our turn. But the Brigand really wants us to target our opponent during our turn. So that's slightly awkward. Uh, but still good. Uh, same with the Vault Buster. Thunder Thief just gives us another instant speed thing to do, that's fine. Lone Shark gives us another plot card, and it's a great one. It's a two for one, we can draw another card off of this. By plotting this, and then next turn casting anything alongside it. And then boom. Yeah, our blue seems very good, and very cool. So I'm super into that. I'm very happy that it looks good, because our blue-green is where most of our rares are. So that's half of that equation right there in blue. Black looks like we have great aggressive stuff. This is a big creature for cheap. This is a really efficient combat trick. These Link Breakers replace themselves immediately when they die, so that leaves your, your board state wide. Uh, Vault Plunderer, 3 mana 3 1, you draw a card off of it to stay ahead in card advantage. Just nice aggro stuff in black, really. Yeah, some cheap removal. Yeah. Black looks like a super solid aggro color, but that's about all there is to it. Some mediocre higher mana instant sorceries here that aren't the most exciting, like the Pitiless Carnage, the Pillage, stuff like that, but just good, aggressive, cheap creatures. For our red, we have our incredible rares, of course, with Hell to Pay, as well as Stingerback Terror. If we have enough beefy creatures, creatures of power 4 or greater, the Scalestorm Summoner can spit out an army of dinosaur tokens over time, so that's pretty sweet as well. We've got efficient removal if our mana fixing is good enough to support it. With Scorching Shot, it requires double red, but it is 2 mana for 5 damage. We've got Prickly Pear, very efficient way to get multiple creatures on board. We've got Mine Raider for a treasure token and Reckless Lackey for a treasure token for some fixing. I am definitely liking the red. I like it better than the white that we saw. So I'm leaning a little more towards blue, red, green than blue, white, green right now. And I also like it a little better than the black. So I'm, I'm leaning blue, red, green over blue, black, green or blue, white, green. 
Uh, unless we have, again, insanely good mana fixing out of the green. I don't think I really want to play more than like three colors here. Because we'll still have plenty of really powerful spells without having to make a very sketchy five color kind of mana base. So green looks like it might be a little bit awkward because there's not a high quantity of spells here. So if there's a, a particularly large amount of filler that we don't want to make the cut, we're going to have a rough time getting enough playables in our main color, but we'll see. Um, Entertainer looks very good. Buff up everything that enters the battlefield. Anklebiter's fine. It'll extend the game. Trading into their best attacker. Bro Fiend is fine. Throw from the saddle's fine. Cheap removal. Snakeskin Veil seems great when we have a bunch of really big, bomby creatures to protect with it. The Commando's flexible. It's a 3 mana 3 3 or a 4 mana 5 5. But if we cast it as a 4 mana 5 5, we do have to delay it. We have to plot it and wait on it. Um, the Giant Beaver is good. The map, the Frontier is going to be great fixing for us. Yeah. I don't think there's like anything that gets cut here. Like Thornado and Full Steam Ahead would be it. The Thornado, just because we're not always going to run against Flyers, but we can just cycle this if we don't need it. So it is main deckable. Um, and then Full Steam Ahead, I don't think we're going to have a really wide board state. We're just going to have some really big, beefy, scary bombs for the most part. This seems a little better when you're going wider. Although, I mean, that is really close to a full-on overrun. That still is a lot of damage. So it could still be worth it, I don't know. Yeah, there's only two cards we might cut here. Everything else is, is solid. I'm liking it. I wouldn't say I'm loving it, but I'm liking it. All right, and then Carlos, we get that Deputy, and we get the uh, Mesa. Yeah, let's go for it. I'm thinking blue, red, green for sure. I'm pretty pumped about that. Uh, we could play the gold pans. I don't think we're going to have room for them in the end, though, because I think there's just plenty of really powerful playables right now. Um, all right, let's get the multicolored cards in here as well, right? Get the right ones in. I do have the buried in the garden out of white. Most exciting thing going on there. Kellen's exciting, too. We have a lot of plotting. I still think we just have so many really powerful things going on right now. We don't need to muddy up the mana base any more than it is already. We've got decent fixing. We have the Deputy, we have the Mesa, the Backwoods, and some treasure. But we don't have, like, insane fixing for a full four color on this one. Certainly not a full five color. Yeah, I'm just going to stick to to Teamer here, to blue, green, and red. And we could even make the mana base easier by picking two of these to be our, our primary colors. I did like the red a bit better than the green. I think green is weaker than our blue and our red. So if we choose green as kind of a tertiary color here, and just splash it for the most part. Does our mana base really get any worse? I don't think it does, because green didn't really give us any fixing. It just gave us one map the frontier. So it isn't necessary for fixing our colors. It does make our mana curve worse, but hopefully sealed. It's going to be slow enough that we don't need too many 1-2 mana cards. We can rely a lot on the double phantom inf interference as well as 2 mana plays to slow our opponents down. I kind of like blue-red spells splashing Bonnie. That can do the thing. If we were green-white, then I think we would have a harder time not playing green as a primary color. Because then we'd have Buried in the Garden and Kellen. And Buried in the Garden, we really want to play cheaper because it's also more fixing. Kellen's a card we really want to cast before we do much of anything else. Is loot even actually that good, come to think of it? A 3-mana 1-2 is going to be really hard to justify if you aren't consistently getting value off of it. This is pretty awkward with all of our good instants as well, like phantom interferences and stuff. We can still get the 2-2 two -two flyers off of it, but ideally we're having those as counters. I actually don't love the loot in here. I think I'm going to drop that as well. This brings us down to 45 cards. 
And then we just remove the weakest creatures, I think, at this point. 18 creature deck. Yeah, I don't think we need to be super creature uh, creature heavy here. Probably the Desperado. We can commit an okay amount of crimes, but I don't think we want to go for like a full out mill kind of win condition. I don't think our deck's going to be slow and grindy enough for that. We could just beat down with some really powerful spells later. I like the Brigand better than the Vault Buster, but they're both a little awkward in here. Definitely like the Mine Raider. Definitely like the Prickly Pear. Scale Storm Summoner. I think we've got enough power for a greater, even if we're not playing green as a main color. This still works with Stoic's Fangs and Stinger Back Terror and Cactus Folk Sure Shot. I guess it doesn't work with the Lone Shark, but it works with the Thunder Thief too. Rope Master. Yeah, plenty. How many outlaws do we have here? That's another uh, sub-strategy of the format is outlaws. So you need assassins, mercenaries, pirates, rogues, and warlocks. Those are the outlaws. The, the easiest way to remember it is uh, something that Lords Limited brought up, which is uh, Wormpy. Just anything that you can stick in your head that's going to let you remember those creature types works. And uh, for me, Wormpy is the most memorable phrase. So W-A-R-M-P. Warlock, Assassin, Rogue, Mercenary, Pirate is how I remember it in my head if I didn't have this uh, reminder text right here when I'm hovering. Um, so how many do we have? We have two Warlocks, no Assassins, five Rogues, four Mercenaries, one Pirate. So... I mean, this seems fine. A 5-mana five 5-4 five, Trample isn't terrible. A 4-mana five 5-4 five, Trample is pretty good. A 3-mana five 5-4 five, Trample is busted. And I think this should be 3 or 4-mana a lot in this deck. So I think I want to keep that in here. We are really clumped up at the 3-4-mana slot, though, so we want to cut some of that. Might cut the Thunder Thief here. I do like its synergies with cards like Emergent Haunting again, but I think all of our other 4-mana cards look a little stronger than it. So we'll cut that out of here. Rope Master is going to be definitely a little narrow, a little bit coin flippy. If you bounce something with this card, it's an incredibly good deal. If you don't bounce something with this card, it's an incredibly bad deal. And there's kind of no in between. So you really want your opponent to have a tapped creature when you play this. Yeah, I could see that. I could also see like a stop cold here getting cut. We still got Trick Shot, Hell to Pay. This town ain't big enough. Phantom Interferences and Scorching Shot. That's still a lot of interaction. I mean, maybe even the Trick Shot, just for how expensive it is. Against the right deck, this will be great. Kill their biggest creature and a token, like a mercenary token or something. Uh, but if they don't have any tokens when you cast this, it's not very efficient. Stop Gold is just better at that point. Yeah, it really depends how the meta shakes up. I know there's some tokens in the set. I don't know how many yet, though. There's a lot of mercenaries, mainly. We'll see. I'm going to cut the trick shot and run stop cold for now, but I could see that being like the opposite is what you're supposed to do um, in the set. We'll see how it plays out. And let's just cut one more three or four mana card. I guess I'll cut the brigand. I don't know how consistent we are at the crime committing especially at sorcery speed for the card. Sure. Drop that. Yeah, sure. This looks pretty good to me. We will call it a deck here. All right, here's a look at our final deck list for today. We are on blue-red with a little splash of green to fit a lot of our strongest cards in the sealed pool together into one nice deck here. We're a little slow, not a lot of early plays, just a reckless lackey, a Canyon Crab and a Silver Deputy holding down the fort, hopefully getting some cheap early Phantom Interferences to counter our opponent's aggressive plays. But we've also got a tiny bit of cheap removal with like Scorching Shot. Once we get to that mid-range and higher though, we've got plenty of powerful spells to cast. We've got Prickly Pear for two creatures on one card, Mine Raider for some more treasures for fixing, 
A scale storm summoner with a good chunk of power four or greater creatures could be a whole on army in a can. And of course, once we get to our really high mana costs, that's where we can try to just run away with it with some powerful rares. In particular, Bonnie Paul clear cutter is insane. A six five reach and a gigantic ox as well. We've got the Stinger back Terror that can be really, really big, up to a 7-7 Flying Trample. We've got the Stoic Sphinx that's incredibly hard to kill and hits our opponent for a quarter of their life total every time it swings in. And I think that's it for the super big, super bomby cards, but plenty of other really powerful stuff like the Cactus Folk Sure Shot makes every other card I just listed even better with Trample and Haste. We've got the Make Your Own Look that can dig for one of those cards and plot it so we can cast it for free the next turn. We've got Plan the Heist for another way to dig for those really powerful cards, and plenty of interaction. A Hell to Pay, This Town Ain't Big Enough, Stop Cold, Scorching Shot, just looks like a really solid deck to start off the format. So without further ado, let's just head into the gameplay and see how it does. Here we are for game one on the play. Well, Prickly Perrin to Hellspur Brute is a super nasty curve. That's going to make me keep a risky hand because of how spicy that is. We really need to draw a land, but if we hit one land, we can play the Brute. So we go pair into Brute here. And there we go. There's the one land we're looking for. It's not a mountain, so we do have a Scorching Shot stranded in our hand, but... Still does mean we can have some explosive stuff here, potentially. Uh-oh. Triple blue before the second red is a little awkward. No green source, obviously awkward with two green spells in hand, but that is more uh, likely since green is a splash in this deck. I would be surprised to see them just throw a removal spell out this early, uh, but I would also be disappointed. I guess it wouldn't be that bad. I could still cast this for four. Yeah, no, it wouldn't matter at all if they did shoot Prickly Pair with removal. Never mind. So we're playing against Red Black, which is probably also an Outlaws kind of deck. Ooh. Um, green Source off the top is incredible. That makes me pretty tempted to just lead with the Sure Shot, since the Brute's going to get Haste next turn anyway. Plus, this is another Outlaw. So the Brute's going to be 2 mana for a 5-4 Haste Trample. It's pretty crazy. I don't think I'm attacking here. Because I want to keep all my stuff on board in case I hit like a 3-drop that I can play Brute and a 3-drop in the same turn, which would be really insane. It's a Blood Hustler, so every time they commit a crime, that gets a plus 1, plus 1 counter. Just once per turn, but that can still get real big real fast. Oh, there's their own health for Brute. This thing's going to be just gross in draft for sure. All right. Bristling Backwoods is the draw, so that's the next red source that we need um, for the Scorching Shot. I could play an Island so I can tap out for my 5-drop instead of just spending 2 mana this turn, which at this point is probably worth it. Because if I do play a Hellspurt Brute and I haste it out, what am I really accomplishing there? We're just trading a Brute for a Brute, and the board state's going to stay mostly the same. The Make Your Own look Luck could actually get us ahead. All right, well, it's a little awkward to plot the Rope Master, but it's way better than plotting the uh, Phantom Interference. I can't, yeah, I was going to say, I can't cast it right now, right? I don't know why it's glowing orange like I can. So we got the free make-your-own-luck thing. A little combo there where we basically got a... 5-mana 4-4 four, four out of it. I would be very surprised by an attack into the revealed Rope Master. Alright. I, mean, I guess it's really not bad for our opponent for us to bounce the Brute when it's going to cost them like 1 mana to replay it. At this point. Like all of their creatures are outlaws. Emergent Haunting. There'd be nothing right now. This is a rogue, so it is another outlaw for our brute. Well, we just play this and see what they do about it. This is going to be a huge haste attack turn if we want it to be. But I do have to worry about blocks. I'm down to 13. This 
explosive derailment kill the sure shot sure they've got the two mana up oh wait no they have to pay the ward never mind i will interference that um do i have the five mana oh my god i have the five mana uh if i pay the five though i don't get to play brute this turn and brute would be hasting right now Still probably worth it to get maximum value out of my spells. And if I played Island before I did that, I could have done both. Mercenary really doesn't block at all here anyway. I suppose we stack an extra damage up here. They have to double block with Peddler and Hustler to kill Sure Shot. I'm going to send it all. All right. Be a big, quick, beefy race here. They're at 10, we're at 13. But we could both swing for tons of damage in one turn. Ooh, there's the Bedevil on the sure shot that buffs the Hustler. Does cost all of their mana thanks to the ward. But it does mean no haste for us next turn on this Brute. Mine Raider. I can... Mine Raider and Scorching Shot, or Mine Raider and Brute? But if I want to play two red spells here, I gotta play Mine Raider as one of them. I think I am gonna just Scorching Shot the Hustler and get in. Got a 3-2 on blocks, and I'm at 13 life. Some single block is fine. Double block is fine. Yeah, we just buff the flyer. All right, they're down to three, and here's a haunting to sit here and not do anything. It's hanging out. Don't worry about it. All right, we get to start things off 1-0, and oh, heading into Game 2. All right, here we are on the play for Game 2 with a beautiful hand. Got great mana here thanks to the Silver Deputy. And the Mirage Mesa, so we can go blue or red, and this picks up a forest for the green. Alternatively, we can pick up a red-green duel here, but that would mean not playing a 3-drop turn 3, which is part of what I was saying about the deputy mostly finding basics. I guess if we top deck a basic though, we might be able to take a turn off. But I would want to plot this turn for, yeah. Luckily we don't need double blue because of the plot cost on the plan the heist, so I do think it is going to be blue, red, and green for these three lands. This Mirage Mesa is going to be an excellent addition to any Desert Commander decks. If there's any other Hazazon players out there? We've been looking for good mana for years. Plot for four on the Lone Shark? Yeah. And this needs to be the second spell that we've cast to draw the card off of it. Ooh. Miriam is very threatening. A 2-mana 3-2 at worst. But every time their mounts attack, they get a plus and plus one counter on it. I don't think there's any vehicles in the format, but there's plenty of mounts. Which can get real big real quick with this card. Could this town ain't big enough and recast Deputy later? That's kind of spicy. 
probably do that next turn if I don't top deck a land. I mean, it might not have been the worst to just do it right now, because if we don't top deck the land next turn, I don't get to play a land for turn, even if I do deputy recast off of the town ain't big enough. Oh, oh we're so dead. At least it's saddle four, but oh my god, that's going to be a three, three first strike lifelink off the first attack and then a four, four first strike lifelink. It has Hexproof during their turn, so I can't use this town ain't big enough at instant speed. I have to do it as a sorcery. That's what we like to call not good. If they play any creature next turn, though, they can saddle it with Miriam and the additional creature. And then also spit out a 3-3 flyer every single turn while gaining 3 and then gaining 4 and then gaining 5. This is so bad. If I cash in the treasure, then I can recast the Silver Deputy and put land 5 on top of my deck. I don't even think I really want to. So I could just... This town ain't big enough and not even... Not even do the thing. I can't attack in because of the first strike. What is this bounce? Non-land permanence? I guess I could just... Sack the treasure... Anyway, I guess if I'm going to sack the treasure either way, then it's better to do like this. So then we hit for one more damage this turn. Got no more deserts in my deck, and I don't really want to top deck a land, so we just decline. If I had another, like, tap desert, maybe I would, because then we play tap land and land the heist or lone shark or something. But we would plot either one of these. We really just need to draw into something to deal with this steed. Which I don't remember what we have in the deck. We got the scorching shot for the five damage. That's our main answer. We've got hell to pay as well. We have some counter spells, but obviously it's too late for those. Yeah, we're just looking for red burn. If we can't kill this incredibly quick, we're incredibly dead. All right, that is not any of the listed cards. Even if I play a 3-3, three, three, this thing is just a way too big first striker. It's a 3-3 three, three first striker. I double block, they first strike the 3-3 three, three and win combat. I guess I can play a no-value Lone Shark, so if they have absolutely nothing... I block the 3-3 three, three first strike with a 3-4. Combat trick absolutely destroys me, as well as an additional creature, so that they can get the 3-3 three, three flyer off of the mount. There's a lot that can go very wrong. Mobile homestead, what on earth is this? Haste as long as you control a mount. Whenever it attacks, look at the top card. If it's a land, put it on the battlefield tapped. Crew 2 for a 3-3. Three, three. So they just crew that and send in a 4-4 four, four now instead. That seems pretty good. No good blocks for a 4-4. Four, four. I mean, I could double block it, but then uh, I'm not killing the steed. on any future turns. Just don't have a 3-4 to hold it off. I guess there are vehicles in the format. Dang, and they hit the land for supreme value as well. Down to 13. You are worthless to me, little summoner friend. I'm getting bombed the heck out. I need interaction, not threats. That is a couple threats. Um, yeah, we still have to just pass to hold the steed off.
I mean, it could threaten a lot of damage off of Sure Shot Brute, Haste the Brute next turn. Not enough damage to outrace them, but a lot. Oh! That is another card you need to kill immediately. All of their creatures for the rest of the game are doubling up their power toughness. Plotting only works as a sorcery, so even if I plot my best card, I don't get to play it till my next turn, so we still get destroyed before then. I guess we can at least see what we would have got. Well, these are pretty good cards, but again, they won't be on board until after their next swing that's for like a million damage. Terror looks actually pretty bad right now because we've got a lot clumped up. Not that it matters, we have basically two turns. We're definitely dead. Railway Brawler hitting us up with a casual 3-mana 6-6. Six, 3-mana six. Three 4-4 four, four mana door. This thing is nuts, though. Can you even plot this and play it for only 4 mana? Alright, what's the most I can do? We have to plot as a sorcery, so we just do that. Four, five, six, seven mana left. So are warlocks, so they are um, outlaws. Sure Shot is also an outlaw. Lackey's an outlaw. You can spend four, and the brute costs three. I can, I can play this and the lackey and... The Brute is the most I can put onto the board here. We can't even afford to attack. Maybe we can find some blocks finally. I mean, again, we could have double blocked the vehicle the first time it attacked, but then the steed would have been getting in, which would have been even worse for us. Alright, well, however we block here, we need to keep our sure shot around now. Actually, no, does this work with tokens? Oh my god, it works with tokens. So it's six, six flyers off the steed every turn. <laughs> well, not every turn, because I get to kill the steed, but it's a six, six flyer, and the sure shot doesn't even matter. It just dies to the flyer. Yep. Looks like the best block we've got. Could kill the townsfolk at the cost of a Stoic Sphinx. If I leave Stoic Sphinx around, I have seven toughness in the sky to double block the 6 6 flyer and only lose one of them. We can try to just chump the townsfolk every turn for the rest of eternity. No, what is that? <laughs> 
Oh my god, just reanimate something? Yeah, just pick up the steed? They have well more than enough mana for um, the phantom interference. Could still hold up a blue and three for a two two at instant speed. I can't do that and cast the terror. I can do it and plot the terror, or I can do it and play a summoner. That's a eight seven because of this uh, railway brawler. I mean, just casting this is better than getting a two two flyer. Man, the saddest part is the way that things are looking now is like I could have stabilized against the, the pretty nuts Steed Miriam start, but just not against the Brawler. It's just so huge what it's done to this board. And now the Steed just hits the board as a 4-4 four, four first strike lifelink. Thanks to the Brawler. Uh, well, we put nine toughness there. Shoot. They kill the shark and the sphinx on this block. They kill shark, sphinx, and terror. It doesn't matter at this point, whatever. I'm sure there's a slightly better block. I don't think it's worth the mental energy at this point. Stop, Railway Brawler. Leave me be, please. All right, well, our opponent was on a really nasty mount deck. We didn't find any interaction to stop their nonsense. So in the end, it feels like we were the ones who got mounted and saddled. All right, here we are for game number three. Emergent Haunting, continuing to look pretty bad. But I think this hand is still definitely a keep with double summoner. If we hit any of our beefy late game creatures, these are going to pop off together. We are definitely looking for another red source for the scorching shot. Opponent is unfortunately on the play, but luckily they don't have the two drops. They're not getting super aggressive on us. But they will have the aggressive tempo lead regardless from being on the play. They do have a three drop. Oh, that is very good. Patient Naturalist. Three mana, two, three, mill three. Put a land from them into your hand. So a three mana, two, three draw card. Pretty nutty. Here's Scale Storm Summoner. We hit a forest. We can sure shot next turn and attack in, get a dino. Conduit Pylons. Nice little desert mana fixing. Sure. I've got a lot of deserts in their sealed pool. It's pretty nice. Ooh, and the 4 mana 4-4 four, four Vigilance with a bunch of upside. Gross. Just shoot that thing right now. I think I'd rather drop another summoner. Threatening to double block here. And when we do find the sure shot mana, now we can double up, get two three ones. All right, no saddle value. I'll just take the four. Definitely not going to double block against a ton of open mana for just any instant speed removal to completely blow me out. Okay, this town ain't big enough. It's actually a really spicy draw because now we can get our haunting active and we bounce their two biggest permanents. We can even wait till after they saddle, and it'll be even worse for them. Because then they tap some extra creatures for nothing. Ooh. 
It says, 6-5 Trample Haste. When it deals combat damage to us, they can sacrifice the creatures that saddled it to draw cards equal to their power and put extra lands on board. It's pretty nasty, uh, but this town ain't big enough. It's going to be pretty nasty, too. Okay. What does this do when it's saddled? Plus one, plus two Menace. Sure. Don't need to respond to that. Okay, they're going to send in the team. Well, then let's... It's going to be a 5 Toughness Menace card. Um, I still think I'd rather kill the Giant Beaver than the Quilled Charger. I could also bounce both and then Scorching Shot the Gitrog. It's probably not worth the damage. Well, you know what? No, I think it probably is. Let's kill the giant beaver. Bounce quilled charger. Naturalist shoot Gitrog. I guess I could just bounce only the charger. Because I don't want to bounce Gitrog because I'm going to kill it with Scorching Shot. I don't want to bounce beaver because I kind of want to just kill it here. Oh, that's still probably better to bounce the beaver. I guess it soaks up a lot of their mana. Oh, hey, Bonnie. Unfortunate. We could surveil for green now, I guess. They have no haste, so hit for nine. We had a green source's attack. Would have been insane. Probably stop on our upkeep so we could surveil in the upkeep if we need to. Removal spell, poke for three. Cast a 1-1. One, one. That is absolutely fine. Fail into the green source, but it comes into play tapped. All right. Show me the haste. End my life. It's not lethal yet. Is double combat trick lethal? Bonnie is definitely the safer play here for multiple blockers. We have three blockers up. Let's have three blockers up and force a chump. a pretty sweet card harvester of misery not sweet enough though there is the concession and we are now two and one heading into a game four all right well as many sketchy keeps as i've had before this one is probably completely unkeepable two of the splash color and all main color cards in hand i don't think you're ever supposed to keep this i mean a single red source and we are popping off but well when you put it that way, go for some LSV level green on this one. Snap keep. How does this hand possibly lose if it has a mountain? We will simply hit the mountain and win the game. Okay, well, the island is not terrible. 
because uh, if I don't hit anything next turn, then I just have a 3-3 flyer and I surveil one. And surveilling helps find the red source. There's the stable master. Oh my god. Do we wombo combo? We plot with the haunting on board? Or do I just get the summoner out? It's going to be a while before we summon anything anyway. I could also just kill the stable master and get rid of their um, mana ramp. I think I'm just going to wombo combo plot though. That feels super worth it. Alright, hold up the Stable Master as a blocker past the turn. There's hell to pay that thing and get some treasure. Probably not. This is a sorcery. Yeah, I'm just going to attack it and see what happens here. And then Summoner post-combat, because Summoner plus Stinger back terror is pretty wild. Reach for the sky. Plus three, plus two, and reach. And they draw a card when that's put into a grave? That's a pretty annoying combat trick. Sure. I'm officially annoyed. Wanted Griffin. When it dies, get a mercenary? Okay. Ooh. The next red source for Scorching Shot. I mean, no matter which one of these I cast, I can't summon her in the same turn. Yeah, I don't think it really matters which one we do. Hell to pay can give us a bunch of treasures later, though, so... Go for the Scorching Shot here. I'll offer the summoner for Griffin trade. Gets a flyer out of the way, and I've got another summoner to cast regardless. Alright, well I need to hit a land or this auto wins. As we saw with our first loss. Oh... Uh... Loses all abilities, right? Yeah? Okay. I mean, it's not a land, but it, it works, I think. Loses all abilities, so it shouldn't have the whenever another creature enters thing going on anymore. Yeah. It doesn't have that stuff going on anymore. Bad Lands Revival, really solid card here. Return a creature straight to the battlefield and another permanent back to the hand. Oh, there's the concession. I think they really wanted to get the extra counters on the Griffin. I saw them rereading the Brawler and the Stop Gold, so I think they didn't realize that it also shut off the abilities, which put them in a bad enough spot that we will find the victory. We are now officially 3-1. and one going at least 50-50 out of our first run of the Outlaws at Thunder Junction. Here we are on the play for game five. We have had some really bad man in the openers, but we've been consistently drawing into the good stuff at least. Let's see if we can keep that up. All right, that's not the great stuff. Um, it does beat the Link Breaker consistently. And I think this hand is really powerful for a long game, so we want to just hold this back and keep them off of us. Um, but yeah, the Lackey is going to be a, a treasure token for us towards the Sphinx if we need it. Um, hmm. I guess I can hold up Phantom Interference here, and if we don't do it, we can crack this draw card, get a treasure, and then we can Sphinx. I think that's fine. Fine. 
it's not like the lackey blocks the servant. It's only stopping one damage a turn. All right, let's counter that. That'll draw them a card. I mean, the lackey's really good at blocking it, but still, them drawing another card here, getting a miniature two for one, is still not uh, great for us. Yep. They commit a crime, they can sack it, put any card from their library into their hand. Ooh, Stoic Sphinx. Would I rather end step this or just play it now and just give it a hexproof during their turn? I think against a black red. If I try to do this in their end step, they might just have instant speed removal up anyway, so I'm just gonna. Well, I don't know. I think I'm still gonna end step it, but it can definitely be worth it sometimes to just play it during your main phase. So you have hexproof during their whole turn. Just in case they uh don't cast anything. They're just holding up instance. Yeah, see, this is exactly why. I honestly think it's kind of too risky to cast it against just three open mana. They choose not to do anything. Yeah, I'm going to wait till they tap out to do it. It's so easy for this to be like two mana, three damage to a creature, destroy target creature, something like that. Now I've got multiple blockers for the Link Breaker, so we might as well chip in. <gasps> they committed a crime. So if they hit us with the Servant, they can sack it and tutor for whatever they want. Oh, they do have the skewer so that, oh, I was going to say, so that our options are to let them tutor for whatever they want or uh, lose our crab, but then they didn't attack, so I guess it doesn't matter. I guess they just don't want to get hit by the crab. Fair enough. I kind of want to just kill this thing, honestly. But that could be wrong, because then if they play some bomb, I'm not killing that. Yeah, I'll just hold off. I'll just get crab value and then sphinx during their turn, because I get crab value by not playing the sphinx right now. Or not. Well, then I'll give this hexproof for their turn instead. We just try to hit them four times with the Sphinx with Hexproof. If I cast anything, they can kill the Sphinx, so honestly, I think our play pattern is just hit with the Sphinx and don't cast anything until they play a Reach or a Flyer. Yeah, because their play pattern is going to be hold up instant speed removal for the Sphinx, and we're just going to be like, yeah, no, that's not going to do it, because I'm not going to let it lose Hexproof. All right, commit the crime for servant could be big. Hopefully whatever they find is expensive enough we just counter it anyway. Without having to worry about uh, Sphinx dying to anything. Sure. Sick work from Phantom Interference. Five, six, seven, eight. Eight is not nine. And there's the concession from our opponent, Stoic Sphinx. This is why they stopped printing Hexproof. It is busted. We are now four and one, heading into round number six. This is going to be a much less exciting Hellspur Brute than we had earlier, but the mana is certainly exciting, so we'll definitely be keeping No. Never mind. 
Berkeley pair is gonna make the Hellspur brute pretty dang cheap. Ooh, prairie dog. Begin of your end step if you haven't cast a spell from your hand, put a plus one plus one counter on it. You can double up plus one plus one counters later. That's a really good card. Two mana, two two lifelink with a bunch of upside. Just going to get that out of my life right now. What is this? Bane of your end step, if you haven't cast a spell from your hand and it doesn't have a flying counter on it, put a flying counter on it. So three mana, two, four flyer. All right. Seems a dece. Here's the prickly pair. The brute only costs three, so we can play a tap land and brute next turn. No blocks. Down to 18. There's Wanted Griffin. Faces itself with a mercenary when it dies. Well, I'm gonna love Rope Master next turn. I've got double red, I've got double green. Let's get double blue off of the Mesa. Cast the Brute pre-combat just in case they want to take the trade, but I don't think they will. But if they did want to take the trade, then that would make it so Brute would not be castable main phase 2. It would be too expensive. Alright, cool. They are down to 16 now. I'm going to send in the Griffin. That means they're going to have a tapped creature for our Rope Master to bounce. Ooh, and get a 5-4 and gain 3. That is a huge, huge stabilizer. So that trades into our Brute. Or they try to outrace us. I mean, they're going to try to outrace us. Little do they know. We have a 4-4 to trade into the 5-4 anyway. Unless they combat trick or something. Well, show me the combat trick. Rope Master already got decent value, even if it dies to a combat trick. It slowed them down, bouncing the Griffin, and soaked up some mana in a combat trick here. Alright, and if it doesn't get combat trick killed, then it did excellent work for us. Ooh, free Strider Lookout. It's a really nice ramp card. Every time they commit a crime, they uh, dig a land out of their deck. Also means they have seven toughness here to just double block Brute and just lose a 3-3. Three, three, which is kind of annoying. Do I want to play Haunting and just Surveil? Is Silver Deputy worse than Surveilling one? Probably not. It's probably better to get it on board and have another uh, Mercenary tapping for buffs. Yeah, because if we can get the Brute to 7 power, then it can send in against these. Uh, where it can't really right now. So you cast the Deputy and pass. They kind of do have us locked down for a second, though. We're just going to stare at each other. It's easy enough for get it's easy enough for us to get Hellspur Brute to the point where it's trading into at least two of their cards that I don't think we should attack until it is. If I use Emergent Haunting to surveil during my upkeep, I'm only gonna have four mana up afterward. I think we have enough powerful five and six mana plays left in the deck that that could be a little risky. We could hit Make Your Own Luck, Bonnie, or This Town Ain't Big Enough. I guess it's only three cards. Uh oh. Is that removal? What on earth is this thing? If no other creature has greater power? Okay, so yeah, it's removal and ramp from the lookout. It's pretty nasty. Another trick? Or does my 2-2 trade up into your great 3-3 rare? They've got another trick. Oh, but that forces them to use a removal spell on a pretty mediocre creature. And, uh... not get the crime trigger. All right, I think it is worth the surveil because there's only three cards that are five or more mana. Anything else would be castable still. 
All right, and it was super worth it. We got rid of a land. We hit a hell to pay. Is there any value to the treasures? Not really, so if the best card to kill is the lookout, I should just kill it. I don't know that it is, though. So it might be killing a griffin. My 1-1 doesn't block anything right now, so I'm taking significant damage. I guess if I don't cast anything, I'm getting a 3-3 flying blocker up, so... It's pretty relevant to just skip this turn. And then worst case scenario, we have a huge hell to pay next turn. Tons of treasure to surveil a million times if we need to. Okay, so they have another flyer coming up. But I can kill that with hell to pay, so I could take this trade. They're playing off the top, so they shouldn't have the combat trick here. Yeah, I think this is fine. Find Stinger back to her, then it's definitely fine. Draw. Alright. Get hell to pay for two. And save it. And I don't need to kill any of their cards right now. To attack in with the terror. Or to hold it up on blocks. Giant beaver. 4-4 oh, four, four vigilance. Saddles up, gets counters on things. That's a great card. I don't mind that at all. Just slow them down. Like, I want to cast something here to buff the terror before I attack in, but like... I guess that's just hell to pay then. I only need to do it for two, but if I do it for two, I don't have five mana up to bounce two of their permanents anyway, so I might as well do it for a million. Let's do it for four. Um, so I still have the two mana. This town ain't big enough up. Uh, if I need it. I probably should have buffed here. I guess it doesn't matter. If I empty my hand, they're dead in one swing either way. And this way I have a chumper just in case of a... Disaster. They've got 6-7 power on board. Yeah, if they give their whole board double strike, I guess I don't die by holding the 1-1 one, one up. But because I've got the... This town ain't big enough, I still wouldn't die. Yeah, I don't know exactly what the mercenary is holding back for, but... Probably some cards that would be fine to have it on blocks against. Alright, buff the beaver. Throw from the saddle, have the beaver kill the terror. No thank you. Bounce that. Bounce my treasure. Now they have already cast a smell for or a smell. A spell for Wingsmith, so they won't have a flying blocker up. And that is game. And poke for eight. All right. We are now five and one. Not quite in the money. We would be in the money in a draft event, but sealed is pretty expensive. 2,000 gems to play, and uh, you get your six packs to build with no matter what. You get three packs for your prizes no matter what. But in order to get all your gems back, you do have to get all the way to a six win run. And even then, you're not, like, in the money, in the money. You're not up in gems until a 7-win run. Um, but yeah, one more win, and we're basically in the money. We get to keep all of our cards for free, essentially. So, really nice place to be either way. Excellent win rate with this deck. We're just playing some busted rares and hoping for the best. And it's worked for the most part, except for the time where our opponent played some busted rares. And we couldn't interact. So, we are 5-1, and one, heading into Game 7.
Ooh, this is potentially a really nice hand. We're gonna have to survive quite a while, but if we get to those high mana costs, we Rope Master slow them down into Bonnie Paul, probably the strongest rare in our deck. And that's saying a lot, because we've gotten some kills off of our giant flying trample dragon. Now we have a hell to pay, so we've got some early removal to help us try to survive here. There's the second blue source for Bonnie. All right, and our opponent is being nice and slow for us. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. I do need to top deck one more land um, at some point, but not badly enough to Silver Deputy over Summoner. Omen Port Vigilante. All right, now we hit the land so we don't even have to Deputy, which means this is a perfect time to just cash in the hell to pay and get a treasure off of it, and then I can jump up the mana curve and cast Bonnie next turn with Summoner on board, which could be just completely game ending. An early Bonnie. Like, Bo is still really big, even if you cast Bonnie early. That's still a 5-5. Five, five. Exile Null then permit till it leaves the battlefield. Ooh, thank you for using that before my bomb rare. Oh my god, now I can bounce that with this town ain't big enough? That's gonna be disgusting later. I can kill their mercenary token and bounce the lassoed thing. Like that a lot. This card's insane. This card is really, really nice. Love that flexibility. Like, it's always the each player bounces a card at worst, which has been decent in every format it's been in. And, like, at best, bouncing two of their things. Like that is really, really nice. Ornery Tumblewag. That's a very good card. Plus one, plus one counter on one of their creatures. Beginning of combat on each of their turns. Ooh, Stingerback Terror? Lord have mercy on my opponent. This is insane. They have four power out. I kind of want to cast the Terror and hold up this town ain't big enough in case they have their own interaction coming up. Mm, really hope to hit a land to make the Terror bigger here, but it is what it is. Small terror is still decent, and I'm still gonna hold up this town ain't big enough over playing Silver Deputy, just to really make sure. If it's like another one of those green removal spells where they're dealing damage or something, then we get to pop off. Okay, this works too. Um, I don't actually want to bounce the lassoed when they have the mana to recast. Oh, but they don't. They only have three mana up. I guess they could replay a land and cast it. Then I get back to summoner. Yeah, this is fine. If Bo dies, we replay Bonnie and get Bo back. If Bo doesn't die, we get to attack with Summoner and get a 3-1 and just get wild here. Okay, they do have the double removal. They got the throne from the saddle there. Okay, Reckless Lackey. Alright, well, Bo gets through. So there's that. Bo is legendary, so I don't want to recast Bonnie right now. Uh, what, this thing's haste? So that'll hit for one more damage. Because they're going to kill Summoner, they're not going to kill Lackey. Five mana to play around with. I can play a Rope Master with nothing to... And one mana removal? Oh my god, they did. Gross. This thing's a mount? Yeah, it saddles and doubles plus and plus one counters. Ew. Well, then I cracked the lackey. I was going to say, I think I'm going to Prickly Pair and Deputy over Rope Master, but if they're going to kill both of these for free, I'm going to crack the lackey and play Prickly Pair off the treasure. Ankle Biter, Death Toucher's big. They're gonna lasso Bow probably. 
Then I get to recast Bonnie. Or they get an ankle biter bow. Alright. Lasso bow. Yeah, this tumblewag is disgusting. It's an insanely huge blocker at this point. Good silver deputy for a land. I know Bonnie triggers and we get to put that land on board immediately, but I still think it would be better to just draw a non-land. I attack all three. They kill one of these for free, but the others are going to clear out the board a little bit. Feels worth it. Especially when we get a Bonnie card draw trigger. If it weren't for the Bonnie card draw trigger, it might not be worth it. But I think with Bonnie drawing, it is worth it to jump attack basically every time. Whenever Wily becomes tapped, gain a life, draw a card, so that counts when uh, saddling for Tumblewag. Can double the counters on itself on the attack. It doesn't get Vigilance, though. But they could saddle without attacking. Which is kind of what they're stuck doing here, yeah. Now they finally have something for me to kill with the Rope Mastery. Let's go. Make Bonnie 7 power. Feels like the play. Ooh. Solid, solid draw. Stop all the combat tricks. Oh my god. Our opponent is doing just an insanely good draw sticking around this game. Or an insanely good job. Did I say insanely good draw? I think I did. Um, let's plan the heist so I can surveil three, draw three next turn. They're getting really close to lethaling us with Tumblewag if they can survive. Seven. I hit for six on the crackback. I could top deck lethal. They need plus four, plus four at instant speed to kill us. We take it. They're just going to plot something? Okay. That was a bad draw. Five mana card here when I'm trying to have an empty hand. Yeah, that was a really bad draw. Four, five, six. I just need one more damage to kill them. I think I have to just draw three without spending mana instead of cast, casting seven mana worth of cards to surveil three, draw three. Mm, that doesn't do it at all. If I make my own luck, I still have the mana up for the Phantom Interference thing. Other creatures of power 4, greater gain, trample, haste. That's not going to kill them. And I guess I plot the sure shot and I flash in the Sphinx. Plot the sure shot because I can flash in the Sphinx if I don't do anything else. If they have a trample trick, we're dead. If not, they're probably dead. Well, they're definitely dead. They're at three here. And everything's going to have, like, haste with sure shot. Whenever Drover attacks while saddled, all of their creatures gain trample. But that doesn't have haste. What did they plot again? Creatures they control get plus one, plus one vigilance. That's pretty big. But that's not going to be enough. They're not going to get any reach here. They get to draw one final card. And it has to be cheap. 
to get the trample. Stagecoach set security for the uh, vigilance. Sure, that still doesn't kill us, so we still kill them with a flyer. The plan is still to kill them with a flyer. Counter on the security, because everything's already lethal anyway. Absolutely chumpity chump here. None of these have reach. So end step flash in a big enough flyer to kill them. And hope their last card is not instant speed removal. And it isn't. So this should be the kill. There's the concession from our opponent. Incredibly close game. Really well played from our opponent. To be able to stick in there that long. Because we got our really spooky bomb rare early. Um, they took a little more while, a little longer to set up the tumble wag. But the tumble wag is also a really spooky bomb rare, especially uh, in conjunction with Wily to be that huge card draw engine, gain a bunch of life. So, really explosive stuff um, on both sides of the table. But I think we had our explosive start a little earlier, and we had a little more explosive with the Bonnie and the Terror. So, that was really impressive how hard it was to. <laughs> To get that last bit of damage in there, they like almost got us there in the end. If they had a trample trick, we were pretty dead, so. Super close game of magic. Super spooky, bomby stuff all around. But we do narrowly find the victory there, and we are now 6-1. and one, Breaking even and being in the money in terms of keeping all of our cards for free. Heading into round number 8, which could be the final boss. We've got two rounds in the chamber to get one final victory with this deck. All right, here we are for that potential final battle. Really nice hand here. Probably go Prickly Pear into the Lone Shark. Because uh, it doesn't look like we're summoning anything anytime soon with this hand. This is probably the 2 3 4 curve. We plot this, then cast this in the Lone Shark for free. We started with a Festering Gulch, green black. Desert land. It's a crime land. All right, green, black, and blue from our opponent. We've got our counter spell up already. Top decking phantom interference. So that's pretty nice. If they cast anything, basically literally anything, I'm just going to counter it. Yep. Uh, because... That is the best way to fit this into the curve here, because we're going to cast Pair, we're going to cast Lone Shark, we're going to cast Make Your Own Luck. It'll be a long time before we're holding up that counter spell again. So to just get ahead in the tempo, counter their first play, feels like pretty good, a pretty reasonable line. That way we're the first one committing to the board instead of them. They are on Soul Tie, green, blue, black. Looks like they probably have a bunch of plot stuff of their own, because that's what Doc Orlock does. And indeed they do. There's their own Lone Shark, so... About time to... Just copy them here. Play our own. Could play a Hellspur Brew. That's kind of spicy. But I think I'm just on Lone Shark value, just like them. Could cast Summoner, which is a Warlock, so it's an Outlaw. Ooh, Stoic Sphinx. So that's going to be Hexproof during our turn. Oh, we might get some Divine Justice here and die to our own Bomb Rare. Uh, but we're going to have an Explosive turn here, right? Summoner's an Outlaw and Lone Shark's an Outlaw. So I cast both of these and Brute only costs one. So I think it's a little better because I can commit three creatures to the board this turn to do that instead of casting Make Your Own Luck. So I am going to do that. So we go Summoner... Um, so that I have cast two or more spells. Then I'm going to draw the card, and then I'm going to Hellspur Brute. 
All right, there's the scorching shot to kill the Sphinx, but that's only if they let it lose hexproof. Hopefully, we can get aggressive enough here that they kind of have to. I guess scorching shot is a sorcery, so we'd have to be in a position where they're f we're forcing them to use like an instant speed removal spell or combat trick during our turn. That's pretty narrow. I don't know about that. We have to kill them in three swings. Let's see. Swing, take, swing, take, swing. Yep, three swings. It's going to be difficult to outrace the Sphinx. This is definitely going to be one of the best rares of the format. This has been consistently great for us and our opponents. All right, well, that's really not that bad. Tap out to remove the Brute. Because I can still trigger the summoner here, which is the big purpose of that. I could Reckless Lackey pre-combat. Try to haste that in for more damage, but it's not really going to get passed anyway, so... Let's... I could Scorching Shot the Lone Shark here. If I'm confident that the Sphinx is going to stay hexproof, I'm pretty confident it's going to. But if I do that instead, I don't get to make my own luck this turn. Feels really worth it to make my own luck this turn. Yeah, this is awkward, but I think I'm on make your own luck here. Which actually does mean I haste in the Lackey. We're down to 11. Let's get some threats. <laughs> okay. Well... It's a little worse when we reveal it, but still casting it for free is a little better, so... We still exile that. So we can cast it for free if we top deck anything it's going to be castable. We've got plenty of mana. If nothing else, our Stoic Sphinx will block theirs, but since it's revealed, they'll know to hold up instant speed removal, because the turn you cast this, it doesn't have hexproof, because well, you've cast a spell. If they hold up instant speed removal there to use on Stoic Sphinx, then they probably don't have a bunch of mana to impact our current board, so maybe we do still outrace them. It will be a close game. 11 to 14 right now. We're at 14, they're at 11. We've got five creatures on board, but they're mostly very small. They've got the one Spooky Sphinx. They are going to plot an Outlaw Stitcher. So they cast it next turn for a 1-4 and... Probably like a 4-4 or something. They're going to try to cast multiple spells next turn. So that's a ton of stats. Oh, and they're just going to hold off on blocks. So they're going for the long game here. I'm pretty okay with that. I am flooding, though. We have Mountain Mountain non-basic Scorching Shot in hand. All right, well. I could crack the Lackey to draw a card, but if it's just like land, it's just so bad. I guess I can just send with everybody, and if they're just gonna take the free kill on Lackey, I might as well draw the card at that point. But if it's actually gonna hit for a damage, then we let it hit for a damage. Alright, well, I don't have anything else to do with this mana, so... Boodoo. Cool, they are at one life. Neither of our red burn spells target face, though, so they don't do anything against the Hexproof card. We just play our own Sphinx and pass. They have one life. We have five creatures on board. They need, like, a full board wipe at this point, or a lot of creatures. Outlaw Stitcher is a good start. That's two blockers off of one spell. Back for more on the Lone Shark plus the Stitcher. That's four blockers, and they kill one of our creatures. It's pretty massive.
Yeah, four blockers against four attackers, but they only have one mana left. If my removal spells resolve, they will still be very dead, and that will wrap the event up. So let's see. Shoot the Lone Shark. And shoot, uh, let's see, one, two, three, five, six. Shoot a four, four. Send in with the team. And that is indeed lethal. That is seven and one with this deck. Our only loss being when we got mounted and saddled by that green white deck. Super, uh, super terrifying uh, mountain saddle synergies from them and low interaction from us. So, yeah, really fun, really explosive run. Um, things were very, very bomb heavy. I think basically every single game we won, it was because we played some really scary bombs like Bonnie, like Stinger Back Terror, like Stoic Sphinx. Uh, so, yeah, really bomb heavy stuff for the most part. It was super, super rare dependent, but that is how sealed tends to be. So I don't want to take that as a huge sign for the format uh, so far. There were a lot of weird synergies here that sometimes worked really well and sometimes worked really um really awkwardly but that's another thing that's more of a sealed kind of thing you can't build really heavily around cards like emergent haunting or really heavily around cards like scale storm summoner like you can in draft where you have a lot more control over your deck so we had this kind of awkward 50 50 in between where we had you know the beefy power four creature sure shot and summoner stuff going on and then we also had the instant speed emergent haunting kind of stuff going on with this and instant speed spells and plot spells and stuff to go with it um, so there, there were some synergy nombos going on for sure, um, but I think the, the cards in the deck were all individually powerful enough to still group up together and, and find us that seven win run. So really cool stuff, really fun format so far, and I'm very excited to dive headfirst into some drafts where we've got some more control over our stuff, and uh, we really get to see how these archetypes shine when you super, super build around them, like casting nothing during your turn with the emergent kind of cards having exclusively really high power creatures uh, with those power four greater build arounds, a lot of stuff like that. Looks like a really sweet set, and I'm super pumped to play some more. But for now, that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members for their support, as well as you for watching the video. If you enjoyed this video and are interested in seeing some more, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more in your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below. If you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.